الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله سبحانه وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam, 1400 years ago, this Ummah faced the greatest tribulation that this world has ever known. We faced an atrocity, the effects of which we are still suffering today. Now most of you are probably thinking, what is this brother talking about? What atrocity, what tribulation, what trial did this Muslim Ummah face that we're still suffering from today? Brothers and sisters in Islam, we lost the most beloved person to us 1400 years ago. And indeed, he is no other than the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Abbas narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَصَابَتْ أَحُدُكُمْ بِمُصِيبَةٍ فَلْيَذْكُرْ مُصِيبَتُهُ بِي فَإِنَّهَا أَعْظَمَ الْمَصَائِبِ That the Prophet ﷺ said that if any of you is afflicted with a tribulation, then let him remember his tribulation by me, meaning by my death. For indeed, it is the greatest of tribulations. Now, if you take a moment to contemplate upon this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, you may come to understand what I may mean. Look back in your lives. Think of all the people you may have lost. Or think of the people who have lost their mothers and their fathers. Think about your brothers and sisters in Palestine in Chechnya, in Bosnia, who witnessed their mothers and sisters being raped, who saw their fathers being killed in front of their eyes. After having witnessed all this and, having after, and after having thought of all this, think about how there is a tribulation which is even greater than that. How there is supposed to be someone who you love even more than your parents, than your children, than your wealth, and anything else in this dunya that you may love. And that is the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Yet why is it that we will cry over our parents and the loss of our wealth and at the same time claim to be Muslim but we don't weep over the death of the Prophet ﷺ? So brothers and sisters in Islam, as you know that we, we take lessons from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and just as we take lessons from his life, we also take lessons from his death. For indeed in his whole life was an example for all of mankind. For those of you who have read the seerah, you know that the Prophet ﷺ, according to the soundest of opinions, he died on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, in the 11th year of the Hijrah. After 11 years of the Hijrah had been made, the Prophet ﷺ died then. But in actuality, that which led to his death actually started on the 29th of Safar. Going back in time now, I want to recap the events that led up to the death of the Prophet ﷺ and what actually happened to him. So starting on the 29th of Safar, the Prophet ﷺ began to get very sick. And he became ill to the extent that his fever, his fever was so high that he would pass in and out of consciousness constantly. He was in and out of consciousness. And for those of you who have ever been unconscious, obviously it's a very uncomfortable feeling to be in. You don't have a recollection of your thoughts you don't have control over your body. You don't know what's going on inside of you and outside of you as well. And this was the state of the Prophet ﷺ as he 
as the days led up to his death. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a very just man. And as of you, for those of you who have read the seerah, you know that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had several wives at that time when he died sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And being the just man that he was, he said to his wives as he recollected them that, that day, he said, "What shall I do? What shall I do?" Meaning that I am in this severe state of sickness, and my death is going to be approaching me soon. So advise me what to do. Now, let's step back for a moment and recollect and think about why would the Prophet Sallallahu be doing this. For those of you who know anything about jurisprudence, Islam is the most just of religions. It gives its right to every person it's due to. And thus, the wives of the husbands have rights over them. And from the rights of the wives is that they should have their allocated amount of time. That each wife has her due time that cannot be taken away from her no matter what happens, except with her permission. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ at this time was trying to achieve. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want to do injustice to any of his wives. So he recollected them that day, trying to indicate to them and not saying directly that he wanted to spend time or the last remainder of his days with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, as she was the most beloved to him. So instead of trying to do any form of oppression, he tried to bring it out of them and say, what shall I do, what shall I do, trying to indicate that he wanted to spend his last moments, his last days with his most beloved wife, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So his wives being the intelligent people they were, the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we know that you love Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and we know that she is beloved to you, so why don't you stay with her? And at this, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he rejoiced, meaning that he didn't have to do anything or have to say anything which might have hurt someone's feelings, but rather the wives themselves realized what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was suggesting. And again, in this very small moment or this small recollection of history, there is a great lesson for us. Two great lessons actually. One is that when a husband may want something from his wife, let him do it in a manner which is appeasing to her that she will be pleased with and that she will not have any ill feelings towards him for. And the second lesson in this is for the sisters, that when your husband may want something from you, accept it in a way or try to understand it in a way that he would want to accept it even if he doesn't come out saying it directly. So these are lessons that we derive just from the small statements and small actions from the Prophet wasallam just prior to his death. So now, five days before his death, the Prophet wasallam, his temperature kept on growing higher and higher and his sickness grew worse and worse. And he was going in and out of consciousness more constantly. Yet, now imagine yourselves in this situation that you're in a scenario that you're in and out of consciousness, you're sick, you're unable to move. Imagine what you would look like on this day. Yet, imagine that you're in a position where you have to take care of a whole nation. You're responsible for many thousands and thousands of people. Imagine what you would look like. And imagine how you would take care of yourself. The Prophet ﷺ took this into consideration. Five days prior to his death, he asked his companions to bring him some water. And in, when, in the authentic hadith it states that seven cups of water were brought to him so that he may wash himself and wipe himself and clean himself so that he may look clean for the people so that when he goes to advise them, or people come to him to seek advice, he looks pleasing to them. It's not someone who is repulsive and drives the people away, but rather the Prophet ﷺ wanted to be a person who brings the people closer to him. And this is what we see, that even in a time of such sickness, the Prophet ﷺ took this into consideration. So, five days prior to his death, the Prophet ﷺ got on to the mandar. This is the same member that he used to climb to give the Jum'ah Khutbah. And he advised the Muslims that day. He advised them with the essence of Islam. Now most of you may be thinking, what is the essence of Islam? And when I tell you what the Prophet wasallam, you may not even see the essence of Islam directly in it, but with time you shall surely learn it. The Prophet wasallam on that day as he got up the member, he said, لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْيَهُودِ وَالنَّصَارَى اتَّخَذُوا قَبُورَ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ مَسَاجِدًا فَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا قَبْرِي وَثَنًا يُعْبَدْ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ فَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا قَبْرِي عِيدًا So the Prophet ﷺ, as he got onto the member that day, he said, May the curse of Allah 
be on the Jews and the Christians. Now pay attention to this. He said, may the curse of Allah be upon the Jews and the Christians. Now why is that? Is it for any small reason? No, it's not. He said, they took the graves of their prophets as a place of worship. So do not take my grave as a place of worship. And in another riwayah, the Prophet wasallam said, do not take my grave as an Eid. Now where is the essence of Islam in this hadith? Why would the Prophet wasallam say such words which are so grave? Why would he want the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be deprived from certain people? It was because the essence of Islam was being taken away. The essence of Islam was being destroyed. And indeed the essence of Islam is Tawheed. The worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And thus the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is showing us over here that the one who deprives Allah of his right and does not give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due right in being worshipped alone, then this man or this individual or this group or this religion or whatever it may be, in this dunya it is deserving of nothing else except for the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the hereafter there is nothing of goodness prepared for them except for the hellfire. So that which you sow is what you shall reap in the hereafter. So this we see again, the Prophet ﷺ five days prior to his death is advising the Muslims again. And in this event are many benefits as well from them. Is that a man should never forget his responsibility. That when you are in charge of a people, fulfill your responsibility to them. Whether it may be by giving the best advice that you can, or by guiding, to them, or by guiding them to that which is best. Or whether it be by just having a mutual care for them and just sitting with them and discussing issues with them. A man should never forget those who he is in charge of. Because indeed all of us over here, we are in charge of one person or another. At the very least, we are in charge of ourselves. And at the very least, we have some responsibility that, we do, that is due to our parents, or our sisters, or our brothers. So next time, when you are in a situation where you may see something going wrong, take that stance of being the advisor and the well-wisher. Because indeed this was the example of the Prophet ﷺ and he was the best of examples. And likewise, on that very day where the Prophet ﷺ was sitting upon the member, like we mentioned earlier on in the khutbah, that one of the essences of Islam and one of the things that Islam stands for is justice. And thus we see that the Prophet ﷺ was the epiphany and the apex of justice. That he never did anything wrong except that he wanted justice done to him. And he never witnessed a justice, an injustice, except that he wanted it corrected right away. So with the Prophet ﷺ, as he was sitting upon that member that day, he said, those people who I may have hit in their backs as a form of punishment, then here is my back in front of you today, so seek your revenge for it. And those people who I have said something wrong about them, or I have harmed their honor, then today my honor is in front of you, Seek your justice from it. Again, another important example, that even though the Prophet ﷺ is suffering from the pangs of death, and death is knocking at his door, the Prophet ﷺ never forgot his duty to the people. And that was doing justice to them at all times. And on a more important note, realizing the fact that you do not want to leave this dunya in a state of having done an injustice to anyone. Because in the akhirah, there will be no time to correct any wrong that you have done. So, correct it while you can in the dunya. Because in the akhirah, you will have good deeds and you will have bad deeds. So, what will end up happening is, if you have wronged someone, your good deeds will be taken away to such a degree that you may have none left. So, in this situation, you will start taking, taking the bad deeds of the people who, have your, who you have wronged and oppressed. And which of us would want to be in such a situation? So continuing on, four days prior to the death of the Prophet ﷺ, he realizes that death is coming closer and closer to him. Not knowing when the, he may say his last words, when will be the last moment that he will advise his companions. So again, the Prophet ﷺ gathered his companions on four days prior to his death, and he said, I advise you with four things. That I want to expel and make it known that no polytheist should remain in the Jazirat al-Arab. That no polytheist should remain in the sacred lands of Mecca and Medina and those places which are around it. 
the second thing the Prophet ﷺ advised the Muslims with, again another key note, pointing out to the justice of the Prophet ﷺ, he said that any treaty or contract that I have made, I want it fulfilled and entertained just as I used to fulfill and entertain the contract. So follow my legacy by fulfilling those contracts and don't do injustice to the people. And lastly, the Prophet ﷺ advised them probably with the greatest of all advices. He advised the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum that he said, stick to the Qur'an and stick to my sunnah. For indeed, in it, if you were to stick to it, you shall never go astray after it. And this was the advice to the companions to the, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most guided of people after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now, if such an advice was applicable to them, then to us it is even more so applicable. Because look at the situation that we are in. The humiliation and disgrace that we face as Muslims every single day. Islam is considered a religion of terrorism. Islam is considered a religion of oppression. Islam is considered a religion of evil and killing. When in its essence, Islam is the most beautiful of religions. It is the most just of religions. And it is a religion that calls towards peace. Yet it is our, it is our shortcomings as Muslims that not doing justice to people, nor to the deen, that the deen is labeled as such. And it is a responsibility upon every single one of us, that in our daily lives, we take those actions which will correct all wrongs. So now, four days prior to the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ was soon to lead the last prayer he would be leading with his companions. So now imagine yourself being in such a state of sickness, being in a state that you're so weak you can barely move. Most of us would probably recite the shortest of surahs. And may, most of us would probably even just give up and say, look, I don't want to leave the salah, I'm feeling too weak. Yet the Prophet wasallam, being that great, courageous leader, he led his companions in Salat al-Maghrib. Now, most of you may be thinking, the Prophet wasallam might have read Surah al-Fatiha and Surah al-Ikhlas, and might have read Surah al-Kawthar with it as well. You know, just to read something after Fatiha. But in actuality, the Prophet wasallam, the last prayer that he led with the people, Salat al-Maghrib, four days prior to his death, he read Surah al-Mursalat, the last surah of the 29th Jews, which is approximately about a page and a half long. So now think in yourself, last time when you were praying Salah behind an Imam, and you thought, man, why is this Imam taking so long to read the Salah? Why is he reciting such long ayahs? Think about if you were behind the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how long his salawat were. Ibn Abbas, afwan, Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pray his qiyam al-layl, used to pray his tahajjud prayers, the prayers that he would get up in the middle of the night, that he used to start from Surah al-Baqarah, then move on to Surah al-Nisa, and then after that used to recite Surah al-Imran. Now, looking at the magnitude of this, or the great size of these ayahs, just imagine what your reaction would be praying behind the Prophet ﷺ. Would any of you have the guts to say, Ya Rasulullah, why are you letting the prayer? Of course not. So next time your fellow Imam does such by extending the prayer a little bit, and I'm sure he's not going to extend it to the degree that the Prophet ﷺ did, recollect in your mind that what would I do had I been in front of the Prophet ﷺ, as this was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, as on occasions he would shorten his prayers, and on other occasions he would lengthen them. So now, one day prior to his death has come. So many events have taken place. What is the Prophet ﷺ going to do one day prior to his death? Just imagine yourselves. You know you're going to be dying soon. What would be the la how would you spend your last moment? The Prophet ﷺ again gathered his companions, gathered his wives, gathered everything that he owned. And this is another amazing fact to know that the Prophet ﷺ was able to gather everything he owned within his arms. And we're going to get to that in a second. And I shall tell you what he actually owned. So, at that time, the Prophet ﷺ had two slaves. Right? He had two slaves in his possession who used to help him with whatever he needed help in. And he said, I'm going to be dying soon, so I'm setting you free today to do as you please. If you want to leave, you're more than welcome to leave. And if I've done any wrong to you, I ask you to forgive me. So now most of us being in such a situation, imagine you are a slave to someone. After you have gained your freedom, 
how many of you would actually want to stay with your owner or your master? None of us would. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, being such a great man, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to be with you at all times, even if we are not under your possession. So grant us this favor by fulfilling us with this honor. That let us be in your company in these last moments, in these moments of pain for you. Let us be of those people who used to help you, just as, you, just as those who used to help you when you were in a state of oneness. So the Prophet wasallam granted this to them. And at that time, the Prophet wasallam was also the owner of seven dirhams. For those of you who know seven dirhams, seven dirhams isn't a lot of money. You can't do too much with it in our time. But this is how much the Prophet wasallam owned at that time. And again, the Prophet wasallam wanting khair for his ummah and setting an ideal example, he gave these seven dirhams in charity to the Muslim ummah, that they should use it however they may need it. And lastly, the Prophet ﷺ had some shields and some cavalry and some weapons that the Prophet ﷺ used for the time of battle. And again, the Prophet ﷺ not wanting anything to go to waste, he said, I dedicate my weapons and my shields and my armor for the Muslim army. So, that, so let them use it when they go out for battle. Again, in these last moments, just think, would you be thinking about benefiting the Muslim Ummah as you know death is approaching you? Would you be thinking about benefiting those people who need to be benefited? Would you be thinking about showing care and respect and love to those people who you were raised with and you grew up with and you nurtured them? How many of us would actually do this? I can almost guarantee for a fact that very few of us, if any of us, would do such. And that was to show love and respect for those people. So now, next time, you're in a state where you may be sick, you may be in a state where you're in a lot of pain, something bad may have happened to you, recollect how the Prophet ﷺ was in situation, in, this, in such a situation. He didn't seek the pity of the people, but rather he showed love and mercy to them. He didn't seek the kindness, but rather he showed them kindness. And this is the example of the Muslim, that even in times of prosperity and adversity, he always shows kindness and mercy to the people. And this was the example of the Prophet ﷺ that we all need to follow. So now the last day has come that the Prophet ﷺ is alive. And the Prophet ﷺ is in the apartment of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which in this very day, for those of you who have been to Masjid al Nabawi, is actually where the grave of the Prophet ﷺ is. So you can see that it's physically attached to the masjid. So in such a situation, the Prophet ﷺ, as we mentioned previously, he was going in and out of a state of consciousness. And he appointed Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu as the Imam for the Muslims at that time. That he said, I am unable to lead the prayers, so I want Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu to lead the prayers. And at this, this was an indirect information for the Muslims that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was to become the next Khalifa for the Muslims. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would only appoint the most knowledgeable of them to become the Imam. As we know, and this is what happens in Salah, that the most knowledgeable of the people of the Qur'an is supposed to lead the Salah. And thus the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa appointed Abu Bakr as the Imam and indirectly appointed Abu Bakr as his Khalifa. So now, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is leading the people in prayer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had a window in his apartment which he could see the people praying in, which was right in front of them. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa desired to see what was going on, he would just lift up the curtain slightly so he could see what was going on. And at this moment, you can imagine that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is so sick and he's unable to pray with the people. Just imagine the agony that they're feeling, that their greatest of leaders the person who is most beloved to them is unable to join them in this great act of worship in Salah. Just imagine how they felt. So at this moment when the Prophet ﷺ lifted up that curtain to see how they were doing and what was going on, just imagine the joy that they felt. Anas radiallahu ta'ala who narrated in this situation that we got so overjoyed that some of us forgot about Salah and wanted to rush towards the Prophet ﷺ. This is how overjoyed they were. 
And at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ was overjoyed to see that the Muslims were still continuing their salah. That they were shoulder to shoulder, toe to toe, standing together as one body, as one body should be united, worshipping their sole creator. The one that sustains them and provides them with everything that they have. So this is the state of the Prophet ﷺ now. And realizing that death was approaching him even sooner and sooner by the minute, he called for his daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. He said, actually Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha narrates this story. And she said that I witnessed Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa One moment she was crying so loud that she didn't know if she'd stop crying. And another moment she was laughing so loud with overjoy that she didn't know if she would stop laughing. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha being the inquisitive person she was, being the person who wanted to know what the Prophet ﷺ advised her with, she asked her, Ya Fatima, what was it that the Prophet ﷺ advised you with? So she, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, said that the Prophet ﷺ told me that he will not be recovering from his illness. He told me that he will not be living after this today. So I started to cry and to weep. For a part of her was leaving this dunya. And then she said, Ya Fatima, after that very instant, instant, I saw you laughing so loud that I assume that you may not stop laughing after that. Why was it that you laughed so much? And she, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me that I would be the first of his family to be joining him in paradise. Now, subhanallah al look at the love that a daughter has for her, her father in such a situation. All of us have fathers here. Look at the relationship with your father. Would you, do you love your father to such a degree that you start to miss and long for his companionship before he even parts? None of us are in such a situation. Yet the Prophet ﷺ, this is the type of relationship he had with his daughter. That before he even died, his daughter was longing for his companionship and her fatherhood before he even left this dunya. So, as the day was coming to an end, the Prophet ﷺ, knew that death was coming upon him. And he was in the compartment or the apartment of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and her brother entered upon them. Her brother being Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr of Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So when, Abu, when Abdurrahman entered the room, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Abdurrahman with a miswak in his hand. And again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasizing the act of purity and the importance of cleanliness in Islam he said, Ya Aisha, ask your brother for the miswak and grant it to me. So the Prophet ﷺ was given a miswak, but he was unable to use the miswak on his own. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, being the loving wife that she was, she said, Ya Rasulullah, grant me this miswak so that I may moisten it for you and clean your teeth with it. So she moistened the miswak and chewed on it a bit and cleaned the teeth of the Prophet ﷺ. So even at the dying moment, the Prophet is thinking about cleanliness and purity and thinking about how he wouldn't want to offend anyone that is near him with his if he had any bad odor coming from him. So again the Prophet kept this in mind. Now Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha she actually became boastful of this event. She said that my saliva was the last saliva to touch the Prophet it was my saliva that, pure, that cleaned and moistened the miswak of the Prophet ﷺ and it was this that the Prophet ﷺ died with. So now, as the death of the Prophet ﷺ is coming closer and closer, he is breathing his last breath. What is the Prophet ﷺ thinking about? Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he narrates in the chapter of Maghazi that the last words of the Prophet ﷺ were now think for yourselves, think for yourselves for a moment. What would be the last words of the Prophet ﷺ? What would he say? What would he do? The last words of the Prophet ﷺ were, "Allahumma arhamni wa ghfirli wa alhaqni bil rafiq al-a'la." O Allah, forgive me, have mercy upon me, and unite me with the highest of companions. Meaning, unite me in your companionship. Now, what lesson can be derived from this? the most important lessons can be derived from these last words of the Prophet ﷺ. First of them, the importance of seeking worship, of making istighfar and seeking the forgiveness of Allah ﷻ. We all know that the Prophet ﷺ, 
was forgiven for every sin that he did, that he did previously and that he might have done in the future. He was forgiven for all of them. Yet why did he do this act of asking forgiveness and making repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It was due to the fact that he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved repentance. And that even though he didn't need to make repentance, he wanted to do that act which was beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that was to seek his forgiveness. Secondly, he sought the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now why would the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seek the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This was due to the fact that none of us will enter Jannah except through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do the greatest amount of deeds that you possibly wish. But at the end of the day, we are not thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He deserves to be thanked. Look at all the blessings that He has given you. Now most of you might start enumerating the amount of money you have. Or you might start thinking of how big your house is. Or you might start thinking how nice of a car you have. But the greatest of blessings are those that you are forgetting. From your eyesight. The ability to smell and touch. The ability to feel. The ability to express your love. These are the greatest of blessings that every single one of us takes for granted every single day of our lives. And if we, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to hold us accountable for not being thankful for these blessings, then we were only deserving of the hellfire. So thus, we, it's only through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we obtain Jannah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to unite each and every one of us in Jannah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these were the last words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the last reminder he left the ummah with. And indirectly saying that by asking Allah, you are pleasing Allah. And that if you were to ask anyone other than Allah, you would only be annoying them and upsetting them. And look at this example. That the more you ask of mankind, the more upset they get with you. Think about your friend that today you're with him in a cafeteria, you're like, can I have a dollar? Then next moment you're in the parking lot, you're like, yeah, can I have a dollar? And after that, later on that night, you want to buy a drink, can I have a dollar? The third time you'll probably say, look man, get lost, I ain't going to give you your dollar. But it's not the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more pleased He gets with you. This is due to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who grants you everything. So now, when you have the ability to ask, ask only of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And forget asking of mankind. Because mankind at the end of the day is only able to help you with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted them. So ask only of mankind. And these were the last words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he thus passed away. Now at this moment, our eyes are supposed to be flooding with tears. Our hearts filled with grief. Yet it is due to the hardness of our hearts. And the fast-paced lives that we live. That we're unable to express this emotion even if we wanted to and wanted to try. So it's at this moment that you are realizing the importance of softening your heart and seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're unable to weep at the loss of the most beloved person to you. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that none of you truly believe until I am more beloved to him than his parents, than his children and all of mankind. So now, after you have just been reminded of the death of the most beloved why is it that we're not weeping over it? So the Prophet ﷺ passed away in those moments, seeking the companionship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he was saying, Allahumma rafiq al a'la, meaning, O oh Allah, the highest of companions. This is what he sought. And as the Prophet ﷺ died that day, his family members were the ones who carried him and washed his body. And he was later buried on where Aisha went in Aisha's compartment or her apartment and this is where he is buried till this day that if you go to Masjid al-Nabawi you will see where the Prophet ﷺ is buried that is where the Prophet ﷺ died and that is where the Prophet ﷺ till this day is there and next time when you actually see the picture now you'll understand or picture the events in your mind that took place at the death of the Prophet ﷺ أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه so now, after all these events have taken place, you can imagine the state of the Ummah. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at that moment was going around saying that he who 
claims that Muhammad has died, then I shall strike him with my sword. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they refused to believe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had died. That the Nabi of Allah, the man who was most beloved to them, the man who received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how could he depart from us? This was the state that they were in at that moment. And at that very moment, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala who wasn't present in the masjid. So as he entered the masjid, he saw the chaos that was going on. He saw the people weeping and crying. And he walked into Aisha radiallahu ta'ala in his apartment. And he said, Ya binti, O oh my daughter, what is it that has taken place? Why is it that the people are in such a state? And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, being that loving and beloved wife, she was in a state of shock herself. She didn't know what to say. She just was lying there as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was lying on her lap with his eyes open. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he understood what had happened. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had passed away. So he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and kissed him on his forehead and closed his eyes. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in history, he's known to have been that soft-spoken man. That man who wasn't known for his courage, but rather was known for his humility and his patience. But now look at the stance that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu took. Being the courageous and brave leader that he was bound to be later on, he went up to the member of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Umar, calm down and sit. Ya Umar, calm down and sit. Ya Umar, calm down and sit. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu being very enthusiastic at that moment, his emotions were overtaking him by the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like we had mentioned, he was threatening to strike the necks of those people who claimed the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wasn't willing to sit. So Abu Bakr, he got up upon the member and started speaking to them. And he said, مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ That those of you who used to worship Muhammad, then know that Muhammad is dead. And those of you who worship Allah, that know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever living and shall never die. Now obviously Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu didn't mean that the Sahaba used to worship the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But rather he meant it in a way that those of you who practiced Islam and did the worships of Islam by just for the sake of Muhammad, then what are you going to do today? What will happen to your Islam? As Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has died. But those of you who are sincere Muslims for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then continue practicing your deen just as you did during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Then he recited the famous ayah in Surah Al-Imran. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ قِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيَجْزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu recited this ayah which translates to that Muhammad was nothing but a messenger. And indeed many messengers have died and passed away before him. So if he dies and is killed, will you turn back on your heels? Will you turn away from Islam? And those of you who turn away from Islam will not harm Allah in the least. You will not do the least bit of harm to Allah by leaving Islam. But those of you who are thankful, then indeed Allah is most rewarding. This was the ayah that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu recited. To which Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said, at a moment where my legs felt that they were filled with the utmost of strength, I became the weakest of creation and I just collapsed. I couldn't move. It was as if these ayahs were recited to me for the first time. And likewise, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in the tafsir of this ayah that when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu recited this ayah, that the companions recited this ayah over and over and over again until they realized that yes, 
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away. So oh, brothers and sisters in Islam, O oh, lovers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now that the most beloved being to you has passed away, next time you are faced with a trial, take a step back, take a moment to reflect and say, I have survived the greatest of atrocities and the greatest of tribulations and the greatest of trials. And as an ummah, if we have survived something like this, then we can survive any other trial that we may face. Whether it may be in the death of a family member, or in loss of wealth, or in loss of honor. All these things are beloved to all of us. But next time we lose any of these things, take a moment to reflect that you have lost the most beloved of things. You have lost the messenger who on Yom Al-Qiyamah will show up and will be asking forgiveness for his ummah and will be making intercession for his ummah. A, at a moment when the whole world is saying nafsi, nafsi, and is concerned for themselves, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying ummati, ummati, my nation, my nation. Imagine a man who loved his nation so much that he's not worried about himself, but rather he's worried and caring for his nation at that time. So now, how will you dare at this moment not show your love and appreciation for such a man? And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us with a great commandment in the Qur'an when He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا اللهم صلِّ وسلِّم وبارِك على نبينا محمد اللهم صلِّ وسلِّم وبارِك على نبينا محمد اللهم صلِّ وسلِّم وبارِك على نبينا محمد اللهم اغفر لي حينا وميتنا وشاهدنا وغائبنا وصغيرنا وكبيرنا وذكرنا وأنثانا وإذا أحييت أحدا منا فأحييه على الإسلام ولا توفيت أحدا منا فتوفاه على الإيمان اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من صختك وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك وبك منك ولا نحسن ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك وصلى الله وسلم